Hi folks, Richard Bellatiel here with Weapons of Choice, and today we're going to explore using a cape in a stage combat sword fight. Historically, the cape was well favored during the Age of Rapier fighting as an auxiliary weapon for civilian sword fights. For example, if you didn't have a dagger with you, you could at least have your left hand armed. Several 16th century fencing masters included it in their instruction books. Uh, by the way, although the terms cloak and cape are used interchangeably these days, there is a difference. The length of a cape can range from anywhere from just below the butt to around the knees, whereas a cloak is always full length. Superman started off with a cape, but over time it's grown into a full length cloak. Robin has a cape, and interestingly, even though Batman is the caped crusader, he actually has a cloak. Now, for your purposes, you'll find that a full cloak is awfully difficult to manage in a fight. A three-foot cape is going to be about one and a half square yards of fabric, whereas a five-foot cloak takes about four and a third square yards. That's almost three times the weight. Trying to move that fabric through the air is a wonderful study of inertia and internal friction. The cloth does not want to stay in motion, and it takes a goodly amount of strength to keep it going where you want it to go. The longer the cape, the exponentially harder it is to control. By the way, if you want to use a cape in your fight, you'd better clear it with your costumer first. If the costumes are rented or made out of delicate material or have expensive elements on them, they're not going to let you bash them with a rapier. Maybe, if you're lucky, they might agree to building some quick rehearsal capes made of remnants, to which you're going to have to tell them that the fighters need to rehearse with the actual cape, not the substitute, because they'll flow differently. And now you've really pissed them off, because what you're asking is for them to build capes for you from scratch, so that it matches the color and other production values, capes that will never be used again, and they have to build these capes before they can work on the rest of the show. Good luck with that. It's funny that while in most of stage combat with weapons, we take the hundreds of possible moves and narrow them down to a more easily mastered several dozen, yet for the cape we do the opposite, because the early fencing masters advocated and demonstrated only a couple of basic techniques with the cape. Since that's a bit boring and not very flashy, we're going to augment the repertoire with a few moves that might not be all that practical in a real fight, but they really show off the cape to its best use and adds a bit of spectacle to your fight. Now to start, we're going to work on the toughest part, simply getting the cape from your shoulders to your arm. When the cape is in place, you need to have the collar running the length of your forearm and the fabric draped over your forearm toward your partner. Think of a waterfall and you want the water going away from you. So it'll be the cape, then your forearm, and then your body. Once you have undone the clasp or tie, reach across that gap and grab the opposite side of the collar. This way, once you bring your hand around your head, the length of the collar will already be positioned along the length of your forearm, and it'll be draped in the correct direction, away from your body. You will have to give it at least one more flip so that the weight of the fabric holds the cloak in place against your arm. The old fencing manuals direct the fighter to use the cloak merely as an impromptu shield, protecting the left side of the body. And it works. Loose hanging fabric is very hard to cut, so the cape is effective in smothering cuts and thrusts, creating an opening for your own attack. But we're also going to use it, as it was never intended to be used, as a full parrying weapon, as we do with a Mengosh dagger. Now unfortunately, in order to get the best look out of a swirling cape, our partner is going to have to use bad form on the attacks, coming in much higher and lower than we would ever accept in a rapier and dagger fight. In order to get the cape to open up and flow, always lead with the hand and try to imagine your elbow trailing behind. Get some alone time with it, just to discover how it wants to move. As a parrying weapon, you'll need to twirl it in front of you, creating a moving wall. Assuming you are using your left hand, a defense to the low left is a clockwise twirl. A defense to the right low is a counterclockwise twirl. Defense left high, counterclockwise twirl. Defense right high, clockwise twirl. Defense against a vertical head cut or diagonal head cut, fielder's choice, either way. Now with each clockwise twirl, you've unwrapped the cloak from your arm once. With each counterclockwise twirl, you've wrapped it up again. You'll need to keep track of that, and sometimes add a few moves just to get the cloak back to where you need it. Naturally, these can be expressed as simple parries, or they can also be augmented as prise de fer, taking control of the opponent's blade and moving it to another quadrant. 
It doesn't change what you do. It all depends on what your opponent sells. These moves can also be expressed as the second half of transfer parries. That's not all you can do with the cape. Incidental moves can be oh, hiding the sword behind the cape so the opponent can't see where the next attack is coming from. Dragging the sword on the ground while retreating, hoping the opponent will step on it so that you can then pull it out from under, causing him to fall. This is a tough one to pull off, as it requires great skill on the part of the victim to make it look real and still remain in complete control. You can toss the cape with the sword tip. Be sure on this one to aim your sword tip several feet above your opponent's head. This one is a little bit of a scary one, and it doesn't work quite that well, but sometimes against multiple opponents it can be fun to throw that in when you're ready to continue the fight not using the cape. You can also use the moving cape as an attacking weapon, as though you were trying to scrape their eyes with the bottom edge of the cape. Now, that is a real danger, so you do have to maintain good distance to keep it safe for your partner. For a prolonged sequence, or when fighting multiple opponents, establish the twirling choreography first, then fill in the attacks to match it. It's much easier for someone to memorize the twirling and then include the fight, rather than work out a complicated fight sequence and develop the twirling to match that. Well, that's it for today, folks. Go out and grab a, an old bathrobe and start practicing some moves. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments below. And um, please like the video, subscribe to the channel, and as always, stay safe and play safe.